Awesome. Well, good morning, Anthem Church. It's brilliant to be here with you all and so good to be with Josh and Renee, as he mentioned, we worked together 18 years ago in a church on the Gold Coast. Wow. Yeah, I know. We were young. We had no idea what we're doing. Now we're just old and we don't know what we're doing. It just, it's all good. And uh, it was incredible. And uh, yeah, starting out in ministry many years ago there on the Gold Coast, who would have thought? Um, and it's so incredible for us to come and see what you guys are doing here. And just the church that has been built, I know it's, um, it's the team, it's everyone and, and what's happening here, but really under your leadership, we just really honour it. Um, what you've done just to, to build a community, to have Christ-centred, Christ-first, and uh, the worship was just incredible. Can we thank the worship team? They're probably <laughs> incredible. Just the lean in and, and all of what you guys were uh, just leaning into the worship there was incredible. My wife and I, we've been married uh, 20 years in December. Um, I lost my wedding ring. Any, who's lost their wedding ring? Men, give us a wave. It's a bit of a thing. Who's not lost it for like 20, how many years? 40 years and you've not lost your wedding ring. It's outstanding. I lost mine in Hawaii paddle boarding on our 10th wedding anniversary. And Christy gave me this ring on our 10th wedding anniversary. So I was like, oh, okay, we'll swapped it. So there we go. So I'm hoping it's not a 10 year occurrence and I lose it on the 20th. Um, my message this morning, I really want to uh, speak into a space that will be centred around families, but it, it, please don't switch off if you're a young adult and you're not yet married, or if you're an empty nester and families have left. It, it, it really is a message for, for us to uh, understand both the Word of God, society, how we play a part in a community and a family, um, and it does uh, centre around a little bit around faith in the home. So let's start with a, a leading text found in Psalm uh, 78 verse 4 and then 7 to 8 it says we will not hide these truths from our children we will not let the next generation uh, we will tell we will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord about his power and his mighty wonders so the next generation might know them even the children not yet born and they in turn will teach their own children so each generation should set its hope anew on God not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. This text here is talking about a multi-generational uh, community. And I look across here and we have a multi-generational community. We've got the cutest baby sitting in the coolest chair <laughs> at the front, right through to the elderly and in between and, and, and everything in between. In fact, right now in society, we have six different generations living. Uh, next year in 2025, Generation Alpha starts. And so we will have seven different generations living. So we've got the silent generation, 1928 through to 1945. Give me a, a wave if you fall into the silent generation. If you're that well, good morning, welcome. It's so good to have you here. So good. We've got the... We've got the boomers, 1946 to 1964. I got, a, I got one of these. Give me a cheer, boomers. They're living their best life right now. They're retired, living it up. That's great. Gen X, 1965 to 1979. Yes. Oh, okay. Hello, Gen X. Millennials, 1980 to 1995. That's me. Just. I was born in 1980. I was referred recently to a geriatric millennial. I was unsure what that meant. I think it meant that I, I, I know what it was like to ride my bike until the street lights came on, but I also can identify with technology. I'm, I'm, I'm on both sides, it's okay. Gen Z, 96 to 2012, you were born, Gen Z. Oh, hello, Gen Z. And Gen Alpha is 2013 to 2024. And that's Gen Alpha, Gen Beta next uh, year will be born. Um, it's a diverse generation that, we suck, uh, that we're seeing at the moment. Uh, the way I would shape it a little bit is that the silent boomer and Generation X, uh, for them, life was often slower paced, would you agree, compared to today. Uh, faith was a shared value across society. Uh, there was a high level of trust in the community and there was high moral standards. But I would say that for the millennial, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, and soon to be Gen Beta, life is frantic. Uh, faith is pushed to the margins. Trust is broken across society in all levels. And there's this moral intolerance where it's shaping that 
truth is no longer a truth, it's gonna be relative to what I believe. And I'm gonna shape and build my own truth. And I think there's three large issues that are starting to be shaped across society that all these generations are starting to encounter. How do all these generations sitting in a room come together and, and view life the same and share life the same and share the Word of God and understand Christ the same? We all have a different mindset and frame of reference around life. And I'm seeing right now that the number one thing in society at the moment is we're seeing a deconstruction of truth. In Judges 21 verse 25, it says, In those days Israel had no king and everyone did as they saw fit. Doesn't that sound like today? It sounds like today that everyone hasn't got a king or a lord of their life. We haven't got a shared value, a society shaped in Christian values. We're now pushing it to the margins and we're creating our own truth that's relative to our feelings. And then the worst part, if I deconstruct the truth, is that if your truth is different to my truth, we're now gonna be combative and be in opposition of one another. And so this is where society is, is coming to around truth. It then pushes us to a disillusionment with our lives. When you haven't got a solid, firm foundation of truth, then you start to be disillusioned with the life that you've created, but you wanna blame everyone else for. I've heard a quote and it said, never has one culture had so much and enjoyed it so little. If you're on unemployment benefits in Australia, you're in the top 5% of money earners in the world. You have a fridge, you're in the top 3% of wealthy people. Relative to our society though, we all think that we haven't got the latest iPhone. The Wi-Fi glitched, come on. <laughs> Life's so hard. And we get disillusioned with this life that we've created and it, and it starts to feed into our faith. And so we run back to God as a magic genie to try and fix it. And so we're, we recreate the truth. We run to the Bible to find the truth that we're first looking for that will fit our already framed mindset. And then what happens is we start to take a step backwards from anyone else that's gonna challenge our truth or because I'm feeling isolated and alone, anxiety, mental health it is an all time high in society. And what's caused by a lack of truth, a disillusionment is then we detach from other people and we become isolated. And we are a more isolated, but yet a more connected world than ever before. We FaceTime anyone around the world at any point. You're connecting, constantly talking on social media, but why is isolation and loneliness listed as some of the biggest problems in the world? Yeah. We're more connected, but less connected. And we detach from others because we don't want our truth challenged and we don't want to uh, enjoy community, yet that's what we want. And what a paradox that we live in. Yeah. Now, you didn't come to church to hear social commentary, so there has to be <laughs> some, some responses to this this morning. And this is what I want to look at. A number of years ago, I read a research paper that led into what creates spiritual vibrancy. And as I looked at the responses to what creates spiritual vibrancy, I saw the responses to these large issues in society, a deconstruction of truth, a disillusionment with our lives and a detachment from others. And we find the solutions through these three aspects and I put them together in a puzzle as a visual picture to help us. And the three parts are trust in an authoritative text. Now this isn't a Christian study, this was just a worldwide study to help spiritual vibrancy. Now we would call trust in an authoritative text would be trust in the Word of God, the Bible. Now this is gonna combat that issue around our deconstruction of truth. The next is a faith community. So faith community involvement, we call that church. And coming together here starts to help us with that detachment from others. And the third aspect is positive family experiences. And as we have this positive family experience, we're not disillusioned with the life that we're creating. And so as we look into these three aspects today, I believe that we can start to, to see how spiritual vibrancy can take place in your life. And I'm 
praying and believing this morning as you leave, one of these particular areas, you'll say, yeah, I probably could lean into that a little bit more. So let's unpack these together this morning. The first we're going to look at is a trust in an authoritative text. Um, A research paper I read called The Global Youth Culture looked at the culture worldwide of teenagers aged 13 to 18. And it unpacked their spiritual life, their social uh, aspects to mental health, sexuality. And in it, it said that in Australia, so it was worldwide, but the Australian portion said that 32% of teenagers identify as Christian. That's fantastic, right? Until you dig a bit deeper. There's six marker points. There is four belief systems or belief statements. So you can have a relationship with God uh, that... Uh, f- faith through God, through Christ alone. And so four basic belief systems and then two actions. Read the Bible once a week and pray once a week. It's a low bar, right? Yeah. That's all we're asking, teenagers. Pray once, read the Bible once and believe these four things. It reduces it from 32% to 3%, which shows this 29% nominal Christians that probably exist maybe outside of just that generation of teenagers. It shapes and shows the, the, the way that we view uh, text, the way that we view whether the Bible is really doing something. Yeah, sure, I'm a Christian, I believe in that, but is the Word of God shaping the way we live fully? And as we read the Bible, we often approach it like the Where's Wally book. If you're looking for yourself in Where's Wally, you've missed the concept. <laughs> It's not you. You're looking for Wally. And yet we go to the Bible and we try to find ourselves. We we put ourselves as the main character. No one ever reads the Bible and goes, yeah, I really identify with Judas. (laughs) Right? No one sits there in the, in the story and go, yeah, like, you know, the guy that got beat up and the Samaritan comes along and helps, you're the one that beat the guy up. No, no, we always put ourselves as the guy who went and helped. No, you didn't. <laughs> David and Goliath, I've got to slay my giant. Okay, look, maybe it's not about that. Maybe the whole picture is that the whole Israel had set up a king as an, as an altar and, a, and an idol in their life. And God was showing them, oh, Saul, the king that you wanted, isn't working out for you. I was your king. I need to return. So through David, which was a full picture of who Christ was, I'm going to come and b- kill sin and death, the Goliath in our world, so we can have access to God. That's the bigger picture. It's about Christ. He's the main picture in the story. And yet we go to the authoritative text and we read it, try to shoehorn our life in to get a positive response. When it comes to the Word of God, we have to read it in the context of the verb moods. And you're like, what, the Bible's moody now? I got moody, I got moody teenagers. I don't need the Bible being moody. Okay, let me explain this. The mood of a verb designates the relationship of the verb's action relative to reality. The following is just two simple aspects. So one of the verb moods is indicative and the other is imperative. So indicative means actuality and imperative is a mood of command. And so what this means is the mood of command, the imperative action when we read the, the Bible, is based off something that was fixed or done through Christ or through God. So what God has done, who He is, what He is, dictates how we act. And so let me explain it. If, 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 you, if you've lost a little bit, we'll, we'll run this exercise through a text. Let's have a look at this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Okay, let's read it a couple of different ways. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Really? It's about you, is it? No, but, but, but I can. I can do. Let's go to the next one. I can do. Now it's all about me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all, all, it's, it's about all. Now that, now that I can do, I'm going to do all things. Okay. Me, me, means in life, I can do it all. I'm going to be the head, not the tail. I'm going to be the victor. I'm going to do it because it's all about all I can do. Hang on, we've missed the whole concept here. 
the only reason you can do all these things is because it's through Christ. We all want to jump to the action as if it's a promise, not based on what God has actually done and which is fixed, which enables us to do what the Bible's saying. Yes, you can do all things. You can do all things through Christ. It's not you doing, it's not I, it's not the all, it's the Christ. In fact, 149 times in the New Testament, the term in Christ is said. There's a hot tip. It's in Christ that we do these things. And yet when we read the Word of God, we come to it, as I said, looking at it from a part where we superimpose ourselves as the main character, or we're looking for the verse that's going to back up our decision. I'm going to make this decision, this massive life decision about dating this person. I'm going to find the scripture and there it is. That's the one. It's the Word of God. I'm going to, I'm going to lean into this business. I'm not saying don't use the Word of God to, to do this, but, but it's not to already back up your predetermined decision. In fact, in the Old Testament, uh, one of the prophets, uh, it, they come to the prophet and they, and they say, um, hey, the, the people all want to do this, I'll paraphrase. Oh, the people want to all do this. And now they want to hear what you say. And he goes, well, God says, yes. Really? He goes, sure. You've already decided in your own hearts. And it's this picture, as he's talking, it's in the book of Ezekiel, where the people are coming and wanting Ezekiel to affirm the decision they already made. And he just goes, yeah, cool, whatever. And I think God's a bit like that sometimes. You come to him and you pray and you read the word and he goes, cool, whatever. You've already decided in your, in your mind. I'm going to try and change your mind. But if you want to come and submit and lay it and read the word through Christ and say, okay, I don't know what the next direction is. I don't know what's next, but I'm just going to come and humbly submit my life to you. Because we all love the Saviour Jesus, but we sometimes don't like the Lord Jesus. We all want to be saved, saved from sin, saved from loss, saved from problems, saved from issues. But then to be the Lord means we're submitting for the future. Oh, you saved me from my past, but I'm not going to give you the Lordship for the future. The Word of God is really clear. And if we want spiritual vibrancy, it's this aspect of where we're aligning our life and having full trust with an authoritative text. Let's look at the second part, which talks about a community. The second part about a faith community is so important. And here you are. Well done. You're at church. That's awesome. Being at church is great. The national average is that people go to church once every five weeks. Now, I heard Anthem people do a whole lot better than that. But they say once every five weeks is an average. Even if you're here weekly, you can be here but not be here. Because being part of a community has to be more when you scripturally dig into this again we're going to align our life to text well let's dig into the text 1 Peter verse 2 2 verse 5 rather says let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood let yourselves be built into this it's these pictures through the new testament that they took that we are going to be built into a temple or into a house or a church People are trying to understand this. What, we are the church? Yes, in one text it says, you are the living stones. So you're actually the stones that build the church. What is the church? The church isn't this. The church is this, us. And coming together, shaped and knitted together using the gifts and talents that God put inside of you. But when you go and look at the temple, these thousands and thousands of kilogram stones being knit together with all of the edges taken off from the quarry and being able to be knit together, laid upon the chief cornerstone, Jesus is what the text talks about, it then starts to knit us together. I don't like the rough rough edges being rubbed off. Anyone else know, know what I'm talking about here? Those bits of character, those bits of attitude. I walked into church last year and my mate goes, you're right. I said, I'm fine. He goes, well, you should tell your face. Okay, I was thinking. That's my thinking face. That's your angry face. I'm walking around all (laughs) angry. Hadn't had a coffee. I was thinking. But the truth is I'm so grateful for a friend that's going to say, hey, mate, just smile. I'm so grateful that I sit at 6am all last year in a connect group with a group of men and we're able to talk to each other. 
and, and bear with each other, one another's burdens and, and, and knock off. If you want to be in community, it's more than this a church Sunday attendance. It has to be a submission of life one to another. And this is where it gets difficult. Uh, it's all right. Spiritual environment. I'll just take the Bible bit. I'll read at home. Okay, we'll just read at home. But you're going to miss a vital part of where you're coming together and being knit together as living stones. Yeah. We all say, oh, we want the Holy Spirit. And, and we've, we've made Christianity to be quite ego or self-centric about us. And the scripture of uh, the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, that's theologically correct. But it says, when we build the temple and the living stones come together, that's where the presence of God resides. The presence of God is here, yes, because the keys was awesome, um, but the presence of God was here because the living stones were knit together and submitted to one another. And in connect group and in life groups and, and relationship of where we could actually say, hey, bear one another's burdens. Um, I said yesterday in our, in our seminar that the, the, the mental health, the counselling, psychology industry is a billion and billions of dollar industry worldwide. Why? Because more than ever before, there's, uh, there's anxiety and depression and mental health. And I say get help, absolutely. But what it's doing is taking a biblical principle and it's come into society where if you share your burdens with one another, in fact, the Bible says that we confess our sins to God for forgiveness, but to one another for freedom. And as I share with Gary my challenges, we sins, but if I share my challenges, my, my problems, my hurts, my frustrations, I find freedom in this. And those rough edges get knocked off. And this is the place of where community is formed. And I want to urge us that church, and this isn't a, uh, Josh will get his friend to come and talk about this and we'll all sign people up for teams. <laughs> there's something about being in a connect group, but there's something about being contributors to the house and serving on team. In, in fact, when I look at families right now and, and, and I came, I said, Gary, do you want to serve on the car park team or the host team? He'd probably not. No, thanks. If I speak to a gentleman that works all week, I spoke to someone after the service, he's a school teacher all week. Hey, do you want to serve in the car park? No, not really. Why? Well, I've done 60 hours with students. I'm tired and Sunday, I just want to come in for me. Okay, that, that's a good thought. But what about another thought if he has a son and I say, why don't you and your son come and serve on the car park together and you can model discipleship? Right, right. Well, now car park takes a whole different purpose, doesn't it? Yeah. What if you came and thought, I'm going to serve on the coffee team, not because um, they need me to serve coffee, but because I need to be with this person to rub off the edges in my life? What if I need to come and serve in the kids ministry team, not exclusively so children can hear the gospel, but because I need to be part of a team that's going to contribute? And as I look at a temple being built, I believe there is U-sized rocks or stones that are missing out of this temple. And you exclude yourself out of the service part and you just, you come in and you leave. You come in and you leave. And that's just attending. I want to challenge the whole church this morning, and I can because I leave after lunch. <laughs> That yes, the Word of God is important, but being active and serving in the life of the church is not about getting tasks done. It's about being the living stones that are knit together to build a community where the Holy Spirit will reside. And so as we come together, yes, the first part is the Word of God. The second part is about a faith community. The third part I want to look at this morning is about positive family experiences. And as I look at these, there's some statistics I want to show up here this morning that talk about how often we pray with children, pray with our spouse, talk about spiritual values, or have a family devotion. These are just some that I pulled out to highlight this aspect of why it's important for faith to go home and not just stay here. This is one aspect of faith formation. In fact, I'm convinced none of you will do a devotion based on what I preach about this morning. I'm not even upset by that. I just understand that Sunday is part of your faith formation, but at home is a large part of your faith formation. 
So if we leave our Christianity to just be Sunday only, we're missing hours and hours and hours of the week in which faith formation will come. So we'll go back to one and we'll look at this. When it comes to praying with children, close to 50% never or rarely pray with their children. If you have children, look to habit stack. Don't try and go, well, we need to carve out 7 p.m. a prayer meeting. No, pray in the car going to school. You have to drive them anyway. We pray every morning going to school. Teenagers, young adults, as you go into university, use that time to pray. We pray in the car every morning with our boys going to school. We only live 1.5 kilometres away. We're not interceding for the nations. (laughs) We're declaring over the day. We're believing that God's gonna give us wisdom. James says, ask for wisdom and he'll give it freely. We pray that their eyes will be open towards other people that we can show the love of God to others. We pray for peace, we pray for joy. And then at night time, as they go to bed, we pray and we are thankful for the day. When it looks at praying for our spouse, this is, this is 52%, don't. Occasionally, we're near 75% of never or rarely praying. When it comes to marriage and prayer, 50% of first marriages end in divorce. 78% of second marriages end in divorce. 26% of couples who go to church together still end in divorce. However, less than 1% of couples who pray together daily end in divorce. It's the one significant statistic that I have found and researched and looked into to say, what is it that can make my marriage be strong? And it is praying together. 50%, percent, 26% still if you come into church. Awesome. That's good. But if we need to pray, we need to pray. We need to talk about spiritual values in the home. We need to have family devotion time. We need to be doing these things in our home in order to bring faith from the margins or the nominal Christian into an active, real Christianity. On the next one you saw before, it is if this signifies one hour, the little marker, the next slide shows 40 hours of influence that a church has on your life each year on average. It's about 40 hours that we would have. So on average, if you come to church 40 times or less than that and the amount of hours, that's about the influence you have. But opposed to the uh, other hours in the week that you have outside of work, school, whatever it would be, it's 3,000 hours. You have hours and hours of where you can influence your family. And we can't just look at church being the place of where we outsource our faith development to. Coming occasionally, 40 hours over the course of the year with our kids to be discipled or you yourself being discipled and coming in, or we can take ownership of this, of where it is both the Word of God, it's in a faith community, but it is also at home. There's some great resources that can help you in the home. If you're a parent with small children, there's a Bible app for kids. It's a brilliant resource that you can use at home. I already saw at the doorway to one of the kids' rooms a QR code where you can get onto the kids' Bible experience that's found in version. And doing devotions with your children and looking at that daily to be able to read it. Can I encourage you, if you have children anywhere from 8, 9, 10 years old and up into the teenage, just spend the next few months, one night a week, watching The Chosen. We just finished doing it with our boys, three boys, and just watching that just brought a reality and a different view and created such incredible conversations around faith in the home. If you're an adult and you've not yet watched it, watch it, it's incredible. Just contextualize and bring scripture to, to, to life in a different way. And so when I look at these three elements, I look at the Word of God, I look at this faith community, and I look at uh, what we do in the home as coming together. I'm going to ask the band to come back up right now. But I want to go back and I want to read that opening scripture in the context of this. In Psalm 78 verse 4, we read, We will not hide these truths from our children. We're not going to hide them. We're not going to hide the truths. We're going to dig into the Word of God. We'll tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord. We're going to share in our faith in this community. We're going to tell them about the miracles that have taken place in our own life. 
We're going to let them know the testimonies. They're going to come in and see. I just had the privilege of taking my two older boys to Fiji on a missions trip, a crusade with 15,000 people out uh, in this field as, with planet shakers. And as we're out there at this crusade, they said, hey, if there's people that need healing right now, would you lift your hand? And there's this guy who lifts his hand and I see my 16 year old son just walk over and say, hey, what can I pray for? And the first one couldn't move his shoulder and he starts praying and the, the guy's shoulder radically gets healed. He goes to the next guy and he said, what, what do you need prayer for? And this big Fijian with this big Afro, he just starts crying. He would have been in his early 20s and he just said, I came here tonight riddled with anxiety and depression and I don't wanna live. And my son said, can I pray for you? And by the end of the night, he's jumping around to a Planet Shakers song, praising God. He's 16, my other son's 14, and they're there together in doing this. And I see it, and I, and I don't just all of a sudden it appear. It has to come because we model this. We walk through, we serve on the door with them. We come in and do ministry together. We read the Word together. We make Sunday home and the Word of God fixed together. Let me illustrate what it would look like if we only do this aspects in isolation because you could be sitting here and go I can go to church that's fine but if you just read the Bible or if you just come to church because you're lonely and you just want to be around people or if you're at home and it's, it's a positive vibe but you haven't integrated the Bible and a church this is what it's a little bit like I'll illustrate it now with our musicians it would be like if the drummer just started to play a beat and it's just one part of spiritual vibrancy, it's just like that. It's like, yeah, we're all sitting there going, that's cool. In about five minutes, that will be annoying. <laughs> but the beat plays and it's good, but it's not the fullness of what all these guys are up here about. So we go, okay, well, we read the Bible and maybe I go to church. So we got two parts together and the bass. Yeah. Oh yeah, we all love the bass. And we have this part together and it's like, okay, well, I read the Bible, I go to church, that's great. So during my week I'm reading, but on Sunday I go to church and that's the fullness of my Christianity. But there's still a part that just seems like it's a little bit hollow and not full and it's where we add the extra bit to it. It's where we get... started to groove. We did this in a church once and they did the most wildly inappropriate song in the secular. And I'm standing here and I'm like, okay, so I just, I go for the, for the groove rather than a known secular song that has really sexual connotations. So thank you guys. We'll stop there. Put your hands together for these guys. You get the picture. You get the picture that in isolation, one part is good, but in its fullness coming together is why this study, I believe, says we reach spiritual vibrancy. I'd love to pray for a group of people this morning. Would you mind standing with me as we close out our service? I didn't grow up, I didn't grow up in a home that was Christian. I don't have the context of what it's like to be praying as a 14 year old in a crusade or to be praying when I'm in trouble at home. I, I came to know Christ at 15 years of age. And I came in and I met a community like this and that definitely did shape who I was and what I was. And it was the Word of God that has been transforming me and changing me ever since that 15 year old gave his heart to the Lord. What I mean by my heart to the Lord, I referenced before, it's I'm not Lord of my own life. It's, it's saying, I need a saviour because I want to be, I need to be saved from my past or saved from the brokenness that's in the world. The Bible says that we all have sinned and fall short. It's not about what you've done. It's about that as a human race, we have fallen short of what God's standard is. We can't live His standard in our own right and we need Christ. We heard about this through communion. And this morning, I'd love to give an opportunity for those that have never prayed a prayer to say, I, I want you, God, to be Lord of my life. And I'd be honoured to pray that prayer with you. It's the power's not in the prayer. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, you shall be saved. The prayer that I offer is like the guide rails that will get you towards that. And so I'd be honoured to pray this morning and to be able to help you take that step in knowing Christ. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? And right now I'm going to pray a prayer. You can repeat it after me. And if you are saying, I would like 
Jesus, for you to be Lord and Saviour of my life, then repeat this prayer after me. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for making a way for me to live a life that you desired. I ask you to come into my heart to be my Lord and my Saviour. Help me to live from this day forward a life that's, that honours you. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Amen. Can we put our hands together and just congratulate anyone that prayed that prayer? If you're in this room this morning and you prayed that prayer for the first time, this incredible faith community that I've even spoken about is gonna help you. Someone either brought you to church, so you're next to them, just turn to them now and let them know that you prayed that prayer. If you didn't come with somebody, we're friendly. The person next to you, you can still turn to and say, hey, I prayed that prayer. And the good news is they're gonna buy you a coffee as well. Um, when I, when I made a decision like that, it was a pretty important covenant we heard about decision years ago. It was called marriage. I stood at the front of the church and, and I prayed this prayer. I really wish at that point, they then took me to a new to faith stand or a new to marriage stand and gave me some seven steps what to do in my early married life. But instead I made a decision and then I was just on my own. Here's the good news. This morning, if you prayed that prayer, the friend that you turned to or your new friend you just met will be able to take you to the New to Faith stand and they'll be able to help you in what those next steps are about what that decision or covenant was. And like in my marriage, I wish I had that, but you can have that with this incredible decision this morning. Let me pray for everyone else this morning, if you would allow me to pray one last time. Lord, I pray right now across every person here, God, that we all acknowledge, myself included, as I'm preaching, I'm looking at some of those statistics and knowing I could be better in some of those areas. So God, I repent from my own behaviour and ask You to come in. Help me to be able to be living in my family. Some of these uh, convictions around devotions and prayer. God, help me do that better. Help me love the Word of God and apply the Word of God in a manner that is not self-centric. And I pray God as I come into my faith community and as this faith community leaves God, that they would look and say, you know what, I could be serving not because they need me, but because I need to be part of this faith community. So God, I pray right now over these three areas, right now you'll speak to every single person here that we could lean into a response in one of those areas. We pray in Jesus' Name, Amen. Amen. Thanks, Josh. Come on, I want to thank Andy. Just an incredible message this morning. Uh, so encouraging. Hey, can I uh, just as you leave today, uh, you know, so often as we leave church, we grab a coffee in the foyer and we chat about our week. Uh, I, I just want to ask you if, if you're chatting to somebody you know uh, in the foyer, um, just, just say, hey, this is what I'm going to do from that message this week. And say, hey, what, what, what's, what are you going to be doing? What's, what's your step? And, and, and maybe even say, hey, can, can we just keep each other accountable on that? Because I, I want to grow in my marriage. I want to grow in my family. I, I want to I lean into community. I want to grow in the Word of God because that's what being a part of a community is all about. You're not in this alone. Like, like you're not meant to do this alone. You weren't created to do this alone. God doesn't even do it alone. He is a community. And so you were created for that. Uh, so today, as we leave, let's take that step. Um, and if you need prayer in any, any area of your life, we have a great prayer team here who would love to stand with you, pray with you, believe with you, uh, and see freedom for anything that, that you might be uh, needing freedom from in Jesus' Name. Come on, can we thank Annie one more time for that message? Great to have these guys with us. I, I think we should get them back. Who wants to see Annie and Christy come back? And be, yeah, I, I, yeah, come back again, guys. We love you guys. Hey, bless you. Have an amazing week. We'll see you next week for Father's Day.